I am really excited to be here talking to you. We're going to be talking about JavaScript uh, futurists. And I don't really know what that means. I just proposed the title and they said OK. So then I kind of, kind of like backfill that. So uh, we'll, we'll discover together what I meant. Uh, as mentioned, I do work at Microsoft, which is uh, this tiny startup in Seattle. You may have heard of it. It's actually pronounced Microsoft. I don't know if you knew that. That's a joke. It's not pronounced that way. Um, <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I am a, the program manager for Visual Studio Code and for JavaScript on Azure. So if you have problems with Azure, it might be my fault. <laughs> uh, I have been doing this for about a month, so I'm still kind of figuring out what a program manager is. So if you ask me the question, it's kind of, eh? <laughs> uh, previous to that, I was at LinkedIn. I, worked, I used to work in Ember as well. Uh, before that, I was at Netflix, uh, Reddit, some other you know, tiny no-name companies. And yeah, so I'm really excited to be here with you now. So, uh, so futurists, what are we talking about here? Uh, what's new with JavaScript? What's new in the tooling and some sick VS Code demos? I think I'm, people want to see VS Code demos, right? OK. <laughs> There's some new features that we announced, and so I'm pretty excited to show them off. They're experimental, so everything might start on fire. So that's OK. <laughs> Uh, I do want you all to know that I do have the cutest dog in Seattle. So that, that's important, right? If you got nothing else from this talk, this is the important slide, right? OK. OK. So ES modules finally in Node.js. This is something that I'm actually really, really excited about. Uh, so previous to this point, we've been doing you know, x equals require dot slash x, right? This is called the common JS pattern. I think we're used to seeing this. We've seen this for years and years and years. It was a really good stopgap for uh, like how Node.js started, and then we kind of adopted that into the browser. It's, it's been a long road to get here, right? Like this has actually been OK. The problem with this is it's totally dynamic, right? And so for the browser, this didn't work because we wanted to be able to do something called tree shaking, right? Tree shaking is just a really weird term for live code inclusion, which is different than dead code elimination, right? I don't know why de dead code elimination and tree shaking aren't the same thing. That sounds like the same thing, but it's not. <laughs> tree shaking is live code inclusion, which means only the code that could ever potentially be run is included rather than eliminating dead things, right? Things that could have never been run. It sounds the same, but it's not. <laughs> uh, so that's going to be slowly phased out. Oh, so we got that for the browser. And uh, now we have this like weird state where we're supposed to be writing ES modules for the browser, but you still kind of have to use CommonJS for Node, right? And we're kind of finally, as of Node 12, you're going to be able to do import X from something, and Node will natively understand that. And I am so excited about that. That works today if you download Node uh, 12 and say, like dash dash experimental modules, oh my god, everything's on fire, then it works. <laughs> uh, cool. So I am very, very, very excited about that. What's new in ES 2019? So here's some more JavaScript features that I am uh, looking forward to and excited about. So object from entries, this is going to be able to create objects from uh, arrays of pairs, I believe. Uh, they kind of fixed json.stringify. If you've never had a problem with that, then good for you. I envy you, right? <laughs> There's just some weird cases where you could really throw json.stringify like just off the deep end, right? And they, they fixed it. It should be totally seamless to most of you. And for the rest of you, you're like, oh my god, why was this not there yesterday, right? So that's good. Trim start and trim end. You're going to be able to trim white space off of the beginning of the end of strings. That's going to ship with ES2019. Most of these are already stage four, so they're kind of already landed in browsers. So stage four means that it is finished, done, and it'll be included in the next spec. It probably bears mentioning how uh, JavaScript gets standardized, right? There's stage zero, which is a straw man proposal. Anyone, anyone in here could go and propose a new, like, I like this in JavaScript. Like, let's get this from uh, Python or this from Ruby or something like that, and let's bring it into JavaScript, right? You can go propose that. Stage one is someone on the committee says, this is cool. I'm interested in this. I'll be the champion for this. So you have to convince someone that your idea is good, right? Like, maybe you don't want semicolons anymore, and you want significant white space, and you should just be writing Python. I don't know. I don't know why you're not. But if you want that, you could go propose that. But you'd have to convince someone on the committee is like, let's do this. 
don't do that. It'll never work. <laughs> um, stage two is uh, they've accepted it, basically, and they're going to start planning other proposals around. So not many stage zeros make it to stage one. Not many stage ones make it to stage two. But once we're in stage two, it's looking pretty good that it's going to land. Once it's in stage three, a browser has picked it up and actually implemented it. In stage four, two browsers have picked it up. And then every year, I think it's in March is the cutoff. They cut it off and say, OK, this is now ES2019 or ES2020. And so it's called the train model that the train runs every single year. So if you make it to stage four, at that point, it's considered part of the JavaScript spec. right? So that's how we ended up here. These are all stage fours, I believe. Yep, these are all stage fours. So trim start and trim, trim end, you're going to be able to cut uh, beginning and the end off of strings of white space. That's just useful. We should have already had it, but uh, we didn't. So <laughs> how many times have we had to like copy and paste something off to Stack Overflow? More times than I care to admit. OK. Uh, Array.prototype.smush. That's a joke. It's not called that. If you follow, there's like a massive controversy that someone made a joke on the TC39 repos, like, let's call it smush. And everyone's like, no smush, right? It's like smush gate is what they were calling it. I'm not making this up. I wish I was. <laughs> there was a problem with it. Normally, you would call it like uh, flattening an array down to like, you know, if I have an array of arrays, I'm going to flatten it down to an array, right? That's normally called flatten in uh, functional programming. Uh, the issue that we ran into is that that breaks old dojo prototype. I can't remember. One of the old ones that everyone's happy that we don't have to write anymore. And if that's not familiar to you, then again, good for you. <laughs> um, it used to augment the array prototype, which no modern framework does except Ember. Sorry, Ember. Uh, and one of them was called Flatten. So we couldn't call it Flatten, so we had to call it something else. So they said, like, let's call it Smush. That was, that was a joke. And no, no one thought it was funny. I thought it was funny. But then everyone got upset about it. And then there was a lot of think pieces. And it was, it was a, a terrible time, dark times. <laughs> so we called it flat and flat map instead of flatten. And everyone's like, fine, whatever, call it whatever, as long as it's not splish. <laughs> and then uh, array.prototype.match all. Like instead of just doing match where it matches the first one, we're going to be able to get match all where it'll just go through and do all of them so we don't have to write dumb iterators anymore. OK, so let, let's get on to what's new in tooling. Uh, Visual Studio Code, I hear that's pretty cool. I don't know. <laughs> it's not new, obviously. Uh, so we announced some really, really cool things uh, at Build, which Build was literally like a couple days ago. Is anyone here at Build? Oh, hey, I missed you. <laughs> uh, so that's our big conference, right, like the I.O. of Microsoft. And we announced some really, really cool things. And I'm going to show you some of them. Uh, one of them that's actually kind of exciting is that uh, my, uh, Windows is going to start shipping with a Windows kernel, or sorry, with a Linux kernels inside of it. So I've never, I've always used a Mac. This is actually literally the first time I've ever given a presentation on a Windows device, and this is actually my device. It's a little Surface Go, and I'm actually quite fond of it. Uh, you can actually run Ubuntu directly into uh, inside of Windows, and everything just works. It's not like fake, like Git bash, kind of like let's map things to Windows. It's, it's a real kernel that you're interacting with. I'll show you that here in just a second. Uh, actually, we can just go ahead and show you that right now. So here, I just got some Visual Studio code open. I'm going to open my terminal here. And you can see, actually, I had this open. <laughs> what? <laughs> That's okay. I can see it. <laughs> uh, display, change display settings. Damn it, Windows. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that hurts. That hurts. It's uh, it's true, but it's, it hurts. Show only on one. Why the hell would you think this was a good idea? Duplicate these displays. Keep changes, please. Look, it's Windows. <laughs> All right. Just kidding. It's Linux. So you can see here, I have this little terminal down here in the bottom of my computer. And if I run this command that I totally knew off the top of my head and did not Google right before I got on stage, it tells you what it's actually running, which is Ubuntu, Bionic, which is kind of fun. And this is running directly inside of my uh, uh, my computer, if I go into slash mount slash C, 
I'm actually inside of everything inside of Windows, and you can see I get a bunch of permissions denied because it doesn't know how to read some things in Windows, which is good for you, believe me. Uh, but you can see program files and all that kind of stuff. I can access all my files, or I can go into my home directory where I have a bunch of code stuff there as well. So this is called WSL, the Windows Subsystem for Linux. And so I'm going to, I'm going to imagine we're going to see more people starting to use this because this is what your server runs on, right? Whereas other environments are like less, you know, have less fidelity. Uh, so I'm quite excited about this, uh, and we'll get to some more demos here in just a second. It's, it's really easy to uh, set up as well, and you can set up like whatever Linux distribution suits you, like there's Debian and SUSE and all of that. You install it from the Windows Store, which is kind of weird, it's like install Linux from Windows Store. Like somewhere Steve Ballmer is turning in his grave. <laughs> He's not dead. That's the joke. <laughs> yeah, he's not dead. <laughs> he's not dead. He's turning from his clipper seats, I guess. <laughs> cool. The next thing I want to show you is that I have a very tiny little Surface Go here that ha is totally gutless, right? If I tried to do real like development from this, it would just be a disaster because there's like four gigabytes of memory and like a processor that uh, I think doubles as like a child's toy. So uh, it's, it's a Pentium. Like how, many, how long has it been since you've heard the word Pentium? Like 20 years? Like 15, something like that? It's a Pentium 2. No, I'm just kidding. It's not. It's, it's, it's a new Pentium called the Pentium Gold, which I don't even know what that means, but it sounds nice. Uh, so point being here, doing real node development on this would be a bit of a stretch, right? So we came up with this thing called Visual Studio Code Remote, where you can actually just spin up a VM, work on the VM, and then just like your, the only thing running on your computer will be the editor, and everything will be running on the VM. So I wanted to give you a couple demos of that. Yeah, so this is the, the specs for it. It's, let's see if I can, there we go. Four gigabytes of RAM right there, and you can see where's the processor. Is it not all oh, right there? Intel Pentium Gold Processor. I wasn't making that up. It's actually a Pentium. All right, so let's do the Node.js demo because this is kind of fun. So I'm going to open this. You can see here I have a couple of VMs running in the, the cloud here. One of them's called Tugboat, one's called Cruise Ship. You can probably guess which one's more powerful than the other one. It's the Tugboat. I'm just kidding, it's not. It's the other one, Cruise Ship. <laughs> and then I have this little nice little tab here. It's called Remote SSH. I just click on this. I'm going to click into tugboat here and say, let's connect to tugboat. So this is going to open a new window in my computer. I really hope, or else this is going to be a really sad demo. <coughs> there we go. So just so you know, the only thing I did to this VM, like I spun it up this morning. It's uh, running in Azure, obviously, because I don't have to pay for it. <laughs> um, but I, just so you know, this would totally work with AWS. It would work with DigitalOcean. This will work with anything, and we're happy that it does that. We just want you to use our stuff and be happy about it. So you can see here, I am on Tugboat. And it's BT Holt Windows, because the name of my user, not that it's running on use, uh, Windows or anything like that. So just to prove my point here, we'll, we'll just say npm init react-app nation.js. You're all familiar with Create React App, right? This does the same thing. It's just running Create React App. So again, none of this is happening on my computer. You can see that it's not on fire as of present. So uh, it is, uh, in theory, all working in the cloud. But this is great, right? This feels like I'm working on a local development environment. And I didn't have to install any software. When you use Visual Studio Code Remote, it just connects to the server downloads the bare minimum like uh, Visual Studio Code, like daemon in the background, starts running it for you, does all this stuff for you. Which is good because I'm a bit of an idiot and I, could, I wouldn't be able to figure that out myself. But you can also install this daemon yourself wherever you want and you can connect to it with uh, Visual Studio Code just as you want to. It also works with containers as well. If you're into containers, I, I hear those are cool. <laughs> okay, so we just made a new app here. Let's uh, move this up so you can see it. OK, and I'm going to move into nation.js. I'm going to say npm run start. <coughs> Should start running. 
Okay, so starting the, de the development server, again, this is on a, a remote VM, probably somewhere in the western United States. Okay, I'm going to open this because I would actually like to, you know, be able to see the local development environment. So I'm just going to say, hey, why don't we forward a port here? It's going to be on port 3000, and I just hit enter. And then it's setting up a port forward, so I can actually just go in here to Chromium, I mean Edge. <laughs> That was a joke, too. <laughs> there you go. That is running from a, like a remote VM. It's running via port forwarding here, but it feels like a local development environment. Hot module refresh, that all will all work as well. So pretty slick development environment, right? I can actually just travel with this. I don't use this keyboard because it's for, apparently for children. It's very <laughs> tiny and hard to type on, right? So I bring like a real keyboard with me. I'm going to get fired for all these jokes against Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> but to take this even like one step further, how much? I'm probably getting pretty close to time here, but I got like two more really cool demos that you just have to see. So, okay, we're going to stop this one. Uh, we're going to go into another one. This is just a really, really basic Express app here in code. And let's actually just open this one. So here you can see that I have some pre-configured uh, places for, to open. These are super easy to set up, by the way. You just go in here. Oh, not this one. It was the other one. The Oh, this is the wrong one. We're in the cloud right now. So we're going to close that one, open the other one. This, by the way, you have to be in Insiders right now, VS Code Insiders, which is like the canary release of this for all this stuff to work. It's coming. It's coming soon. Uh, this is what I want to show you. It, oh, it's right here. So this is really easy to set up new hosts as well. You just grab the IP and the username and make sure that your SS key work, SSH keys are all set up, and then everything just works. I could show you, but it's really boring to watch, so I'm not going to make you sit through that. All right, so I'm going to open an SSH, SSH window to this code directory. All right, so this is a different folder, same machine. This is like a eight core, like a 16 gigabyte VM. It's not that big, but no development's not, doesn't require that much. And this costs like 30 cents an hour to run or something like that. It's really, really cheap to run. So I mean, this was a $400 machine. Running a, a VM for like eight hours a day costs you two bucks, right? That's a lot cheaper than a $2,000 Surface Book or MacBook or something like that. Okay. So what I want to do here is I'm going to go into this debug mode. Let's open an app here. And I'm going to say console.log. Like, you know when you're like trying to figure out where stuff runs and you just put like console.log something in there? Uh, whenever I'm doing that, I speak like a 14-year-old girl. It's like lol, raffle, oh my god, right? I don't know why, but I've been doing that for like a decade. <laughs> Probably something I should bring up with my therapist. <laughs> OK, so I'm going to click here. This little red dot means I'm going to put a debug point there. And then I'm going to do the debugger. I'm going to click Launch Program. So this will launch it in the cloud running. You can see here the debugger has been attached. i got to go in here and forward the port as well. You can set it up so you don't have to do this every time as well. So that's setting up the port. Again, this is really just a hello world of Express. So there you go. We're actually in the debugger now, de remotely debugging from that. Pro so if I hit uh, next here, you can see lol right there. And I can, I can see, if I go back to the debug view, every, all the variables like what this is, what next is, what rec and res are. You can see what the globals are as well. Like, Again, feeling super, super local, right? But you're, this is all happening in the cloud. <laughs> OK, I got one more demo to show you because I have unlimited Microsoft budget, and I spun up the biggest VM you possibly can. I would not recommend this one for you, personally, unless you're doing crazy stuff. So let's connect here to cruise ship. Uh, let's see, not you. Yeah, cruise ship. So this is the biggest VM you can run on, excluding our GPU ones. Those ones are ridiculous and also quite expensive. But if you want to like Bitcoin mine, go for it. Actually, don't. But um, 
just like pro tip for life, don't do Bitcoin. <laughs> Some, I'm, I upset someone, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. So what I wanted to show you with this one, uh, this is actually a demo from one of my colleagues at uh, Microsoft. His name is Ryan Levick, lives in Berlin, and he does a lot of like, Rust core developments, specifically around WebAssembly. And so I was trying to find some really cool demo to show you of like, what's something that we could do that's just ridiculous you can never do on this computer. So one of them is compile the entire Rust language, right? Which is ridiculous. It, it, on his MacBook, it takes two and a half hours, right? On this one, you would just start a fire, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> I tried, and I gave up after an hour. So what I want to show you right now, let's do x.pyclean. I learned a lot about Rust yesterday. Uh, this is just going to go through and clean every, all, like, all the things out. Takes a second. All right. And then here on this other one, oh, we're going to start up a new terminal as well, and we're going to say htop. So you can see here, this has 64 <laughs> cores, right? <laughs> so right now, I'm... <laughs> yeah, no, it's okay. It does okay. 252 gigs of RAM. <laughs> Is that enough? Should I get more? OK. OK, so here we're going to say xpy uh, build. OK. So this goes down from on his uh, relatively modern MacBook from two and a half hours to compile. I don't even care what this is doing. But if we go back here to the H top here, you'll see this start lighting up pretty well, because this paralyzes pretty well. It goes from two and a half hours down to like 16 minutes or something like that. So he actually spins up one of these VMs in the cloud, runs the build on it, and then he moves it to a cheaper VM because this thing costs like $3 an hour, $3.50 an hour to run. If you leave it running all month, it's only like 2500 bucks. So <laughs> pretty cool though, right? So all this stuff, like I'm compiling Rust on this very cheap computer, right? Like, how cool is that? And it's all done in Linux. It's all, like, I don't know anything about Windows, but this is all very familiar to me because most of the time I'm working in Linux anyway. So look at that. That's so cool. I'm just amused by the graph. All right. So damn it, PowerPoint. I say that a lot about Windows products. <laughs> <laughs> So that was the rest demo. Uh, I, I dropped you a link down there. You should, it's a really like three minute article about what, how he did all this stuff, which I just copied, right, like line for line. That was his demo, so give him all the credit. Uh, Bitly slash dev dash rust, or you can find it, it's on dev.to. He has a whole write up on how he did all this kind of stuff. And VS Code Remote is available now if you're interested in it. Again, you have to be on the insiders build, but if you're on insiders and it works. And yeah, thank you for listening. Thank you.